Well, welcome, man. I appreciate you coming down. Thank you. Thank you for having uh, me. So originally how this was set up, uh, I had a call out on Twitter looking for people that I can sit down and talk about Keynesian versus Austrian economics. And your name came up like a hundred times. And thank you so much for agreeing to come on the show. And I kind of really want to jump into it. I have like two primary questions for you. Um, question number one, what got you interested in Bitcoin? Well, let's talk about that. And then we'll go into what your definitions and differences between the two philosophies of economics. Yeah. So what got me originally interested in Bitcoin was that I was interested in Austrian economics in the first place. Even though I did my PhD at uh, Columbia University and my PhD was not in Austrian economics, it was very much um, mainstream economics. I started reading um, more and more Austrian economics uh, books uh, thanks to the Mises Institute's website, basically. And um, I found myself more and more interested in the concepts of that school, in particular the concept of uh, money and sound money mm -hmm. and a free market in money and uh, the um, monetary um, results, the results of monetary manipulation or central planning of the interest rate. So these were issues that I was quite interested in in 2008, 2009, 2010, around which point Bitcoin came out. And I heard about Bitcoin because of, uh, you know, uh, being interested in these uh, topic and initially you know I was quite skeptical of um, the possibility that Bitcoin could work I wasn't really sure that it uh, sure. it could succeed that sure. it could um, sustain um, continuous operation for a significant amount of time I thought it would be attacked but over time you know it continued to refuse to go away and I continued to learn more and more about it about how cryptography works and about the technical aspects of uh, the proof of work and all of these um, aspects of how Bitcoin is secured and how it's operated mm. And so I became more and more interested and fascinated with it. Were you studying Austrian economics while you were still in school? or? Well, you? I was studying it on my own, but I wasn't I really part of my uh, program for graduation. I wonder why they never teach it, though. Yeah, very interesting question. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if you're supposed to be uh, you know, an, an, an institution of learning. Yeah. And so... What was your aha moment when you really understood Bitcoin, like this is something? Um, I think really primarily the uh, moment that I realized, okay, Bitcoin is uh, something uh, real was probably in 2013. In, um, uh, you know, until then I'd been hearing about Bitcoin as an obscure thing in the internet and I was watching it grow and I was continuously skeptical of the possibility that it would survive. And in my mind, there were, you know, several scenarios in which uh, that I imagined would be fatal to Bitcoin. And because it was so small and because it was so tiny, I thought, you know, some major event of bad publicity, somebody who's dealing with Bitcoin gets thrown in jail, um, gets implicated in some criminal activity, mm. rightly or wrongly. And that's just going to be devastating for the market. It'll destroy the market, it'll destroy the value of the coin probably destroy the security of the coin. And so at that stage, you know, I was still skeptical of the possibility that this kind of economic um, system, all of these economic incentives together could continue to sustain such a significant um, negative shock. And then that happened around um, mid 2013 with the um, with, with, with the Silk Road mm -hmm. bust. And so in my mind, this was supposed to be what was going to be the end of Bitcoin. And yet Bitcoin didn't collapse, it didn't fail, in fact, it continued to grow. And, um, you know, the, the number of transactions on the network continued to increase. And uh, the fact that it, you know, it emerged from this incident stronger than before in arguably any technical um, indicator you could choose was really the moment that I thought, okay, this is something serious. There's, there's a very good alignment of economic incentives in this that has made me revise my initial skepticism mm -hmm. and make me think that, okay, this thing has legs, it can run, it can continue to run for another decade or two or three or But when 50. you, when you understood it, when you had the aha moment, were you viewing Bitcoin more or less as a means of exchange as currency or were, were you viewing it as something as digital gold, which is a narrative today? You know, I think it's 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 quite unfortunate that people see those two things as black being and white. Um, black and white, and as also as being distinct properties. When in 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 a very real sense, the two properties are 
inextricably linked, that they're intertwined, they can't be separated. In other words, anytime something is chosen as a medium of exchange, it means that it is acquired for the sake of being exchanged later on. Mm -hmm. So during that period, there's a period in which it is held purely as a store of value. So you can't be a medium of exchange unless you're a store of value. And you can't be a store of value. And, and you know, to be a store of value is to then be used as a medium of exchange because the point of storing the value is to later on exchange it. So these two functions are quite, um, uh, are very strongly linked. That they, ha they have to come together and they're just uh, how, um, how money emerges on a market. These are the properties of what makes something money, basically. For example, the USD currency. Yeah. Yeah. And so, well, yeah, because I mean, the only way that the dollar has uh, gotten its monetary status, force. not quite, is because it was backed by gold. Well, it was backed by gold. Yes, and it still is because, you know, the, the central bank of the United States still holds a very large amount of gold. And it central banks gold, still but it's not pegged. gold. No, it is not. However, the central bank of the United States is the one that holds the most amount of gold. Mm -hmm. That's why the, the global monetary system was built around the dollar because the, the U.S. Uh, central bank had the most amount of dollars after World War II. But the, uh, the, they, the thing they is... They also confiscated everyone's gold, too. Well, exactly, oh, yes. Fuck. Yeah, but that's, that's the thing. So it's, it's not about, uh, you know, the, the key thing is that government is not able to dictate what money is. So no government has ever been able to pass off its own pieces of paper as money mm -hmm. successfully. It has had to have these pieces of paper backed by a money that was either the choice of a market like gold or silver at certain points in time, or that it was backed by a currency that is backed by these things. So today, a lot of central banks have currencies that are not backed by gold, but are backed by currencies that are backed by gold, mm -hmm. that have gold. So the world's central banks still continue to hold gold. And so effectively, the choice of the money in the market is still the market's choice. Governments, their, um, you know, what they try to do is to try to appropriate that choice. So that's why they confiscated the gold. Mm -hmm. They couldn't just ban gold's monetary role. They had to confiscate it. And that's why Bitcoin is so interesting, because it is designed with one <laughs> prime directive and objective in mind, which is to resist confiscation and to resist centralization and centralized control. That's what makes it so interesting. Would you say another interesting aspect is, at least for now, the, the, the issuance is set in stone, right? For example, since they unpegged the gold, the supply and demand issuance of at least the USD has skyrocketed, like with quantitative easing, they printed $2 trillion worth of money. Simple mathematics, if you have more supply, what happens? The demand decreases yep. for the market. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a key concept that I discuss in my book, which is that ultimately Bitcoin is heading towards being the uh, form of money whose supply increases at the lowest rate, uh, at the reliably lowest rate. And um, it's going to go below the rate of increase of gold over the next few years. And so this arguably has been extremely important for gold assuming its monetary role because mm -hmm. this is what the thing that makes gold so different from all other metals that the uh, new supply is always a very tiny fraction compared to the um, overall stockpiles so the supply of gold is always increasing at a very small rate but bitcoin is going to start increasing at a lower rate yes. and eventually tend towards zero so it's the first example of an asset of a liquid asset that we as humans have ha ever had that is truly strictly scarce in a meaningful sense because everything else is only scarce in a relative sense. It's scarce in the sense of um, there's a limit on how much time we dedicate towards um, mm -hmm. producing more of it. But Bitcoin is strictly scarce. That not, none of it, no, no more than 21 of it can be made. Whereas with other things, you know, no matter how scarce they are, if we dedicate more resources towards digging for copper or gold or silver or oil, we'll always find more. We always continue to find more. What's going to happen once the mining rewards disappear in the future? Well, the way that I look at it is that, you know, if people value the service that Bitcoin provides, then people will continue to pay for Bitcoin blocks. If Bitcoin block space continues to be valuable, people will pay to get on it. And so sure. currently the way in which you pay for um, getting on a Bitcoin block is that holding the Bitcoins, you know, the monetary 
what secures the network ultimately is that people hold the coins, which gives the coins values. And that gives the mining rewards value so that miners want to secure the network, want to dedicate their um, electricity and um, processing power towards securing the network because they know the coins would be liquid and they'd be able to uh, sell them. So as a holder, you're subsidizing the network by accepting all the new inflation or all the new creation of um, coins that is effectively increasing the supply, therefore bringing down the price of the existing coins. So currently, the security of the network comes from the fact that the holders are willing to sustain the inflationary dumping of new coins, which you know today is in the volume of, I think, around five or six or seven million dollars a day okay, of yeah. uh, new Bitcoins that are being produced on the market. So as a Bitcoin holder, you know, you're accepting that that stuff is chipping away at the price because that's new supply that's coming onto the market to meet the new demand. Um, so that's how it is uh, being subsidized today. That's how Bitcoin security is being paid for today, primarily. However, I see no reason why if people value the block space and people value the holding of the mm -hmm. coins, that they wouldn't be paying for the block space. And so they would, uh, you know, we saw it in December of 2017. We saw how a transaction fee market developed. Yes. And I see no reason why it wouldn't develop. In my mind, you know, there, of course, if people decide that they don't value Bitcoin enough, if the demand for Bitcoin declines and, you know, the price of one Bitcoin drops to five cents, then arguably, yeah, Bitcoin security is going to be compromised and arguably it's going to be easy to attack it and arguably potentially it would fail. Mm -hmm. How, but that's always the scenario. So I think there's no, the, that's still the case whether you're going with transaction fees or whether you're going with the current uh, mining reward. Um, uh, eventually, if people don't value it, they're not going to pay for it and then the system falls apart. But if people value it, then they'll continue to pay for it, whether it's through transaction fees or through the reward, and it will continue to operate. So I don't see why transitioning towards a fee market should be any uh, uh, different or any, uh, any, um, any, any problem for Bitcoin. The, what Bitcoin needs is just to continue to have demand in, in both cases. Where do you think the future of mining is going to go with Bitcoin? Do you think we're going to get smaller nanometers for like ASICs chips? Do you think it's going to be cheaper electricity? It's going to hit the market? Like, where do you foresee mining within this industry? I think the one important trend that is emerging from mining um, is that anybody who's using um, grid priced electricity to mine yes. or um, to mine based on um, fossil fuel powered plants is largely not going to be able to make a profit. Mm. I think over several years, uh, there's quite a good reason to suggest that if you're mining with, um, if, if you're mining based on the price of electricity that is available in a major city yeah. or in major industrial centers, you are almost certainly going to be losing money. Well, not almost certainly, but in the long run, it's not going to always be profitable. And I think that's something that's always going to be the case with Bitcoin because mm -hmm. of the difficulty adjustment, which I discuss in depth in my book. And I find them to be the most uh, fascinating aspect of Bitcoin's economic design. The difficulty adjustment makes it so that it's always increasing the um, margin. Uh, it's, it's always increasing the difficulty of finding the block rewards mm -hmm. and therefore making it less and less profitable for the miners. So in other words, if you are able to be profitable mining Bitcoin at 10 cents per kilowatt hour today, then that, that's a relatively cheap price. That's a relatively affordable price that's available to many people all over the world. Yeah, to everybody, yeah. It's going to be a very large amount of people that are going to be able to profit from it. And so many of them are going to start mining at that price. And so therefore, the difficulty will adjust upward, which is going to lead to the profitability of people mining at 10 cents to drop and then to be eroded away. And so when push comes to shove, like in the bear market, as we've seen over the last year or so, the only miners that continue to remain profitable are the ones that are operating with 
energy that has a close to zero marginal cost. Yeah. Because in these locations, you know, where the energy has no alternative use, you have excess energy that's isolated, stranded, that can't be connected to um, a grid and can't be sent to a major city, that's energy that's practically free. So building mining installations around these areas is what's going to be profitable. So the um, exciting thing about Bitcoin mining is that it's leading to more and more development around these isolated places. And so that's going to lead to more and more uh, growth in all of these kinds of... I saw uh, like an interesting stat that because of Bitcoin mining, we're actually finding out true price discovery of, of uh, energy. Absolutely. It's creating a global liquid market in energy where energy can now be bought and sold and um, anywhere in the world because it can be converted into Bitcoin hashes and therefore monetized. Mm -hmm. So anywhere in the world where you have a source of energy, you can sell it effectively by installing Bitcoin miners there and making them do the work, which oh. is which which is which can be a, a massive initial step towards capitalizing these um, places, towards uh, building capital investment in these places, yeah. towards utilizing the energy sources. Because they're just not there. mining Bitcoin, they're mining anything that's a proof of work chain, right? Yeah. And so what's your thoughts now then on, on all these different derivatives now? Like, so we had like the big one, the forked Bitcoin Cash, and they had your own internal world, that Bitcoin Cash, and yeah. B, B, whatever, BSV. So what's your yeah. thoughts on all this? Well, now there's like shit ton of forks. I can't even keep up with how many forks are going Yeah, that's, that's the point. So, I mean, the more that Bitcoin forks happen, the, uh, the more they dilute their own brand. Yes. So nobody now remembers what kind of uh, fork is there out there. And each one of them becomes just a stupid cult of personality around the person around it. Um, so essentially none of them matter. And, you know, this whole exercise has served to really illustrate what is it what it is exactly that is important about bitcoin yeah and that is that nobody controls it and so you know it doesn't it's not about the size of the blocks it's not about the block time it's not about any one particular uh, technical uh, decision that's not what makes bitcoin important what makes bitcoin important is that no single person or entity is able to control it and to determine how it uh, proceeds and so um, the problem with all those forks is that they all start off from the point that one person decided that this is the correct way in which we need to go. Mm -hmm. And so that person decided to um, fork off in that direction. So, you know, good luck to them because now all they have is something that they control that they're going to continue to control. So none of them matter. Mm -hmm. And so once you discovered or started reading more about uh, Austrian economics and discovering Bitcoin, um, how do you how do you see Austrian economics helping the global economy? Like, why do you believe? I want to say believe. But what kind of advice can you tell people that Austrian ec economics might be a better model than what we have today with Keynesian economics? Um, I mean, it's a difficult question to really answer. I think the the the, um, the 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 prime value proposition, as far as I'm concerned, is that I think it's a better way of understanding the world. Mm. It's a way that makes more sense. I think. Um, in my opinion, if you spend a lot of time reading um, both viewpoints, I think you'll come to the conclusion that you know, you're able to get a better grasp of reality by understanding the works of classical Austrian economists um, and their way of explaining the world. So that's primarily the main uh, advantage. The second thing is that, you know, based on understanding this, the unpopular, politically unpopular conclusion that the Austrian economists come up with is about how the nature of the market system functions because of the price mechanism mm -hmm. and because prices serve to communicate knowledge and information. And so the way that the market system functions has to involve people making their own decisions, able to calculate their own preferences and make their own decisions based on how much they uh, value their time and their labor mm -hmm. and their different goods and services. So in order for the market system to truly function, people have to have the decision, the freedom to take their own decisions, both in production and in consumption. And so therefore, any time somebody intervenes in someone's freedom, in someone's economic freedom, anytime somebody imposes a, an economic decision on somebody else, there's no escaping the, 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 the fact that that's going to be um, you know, that's uh, uh, first, it's immoral because if you can't accept that those two people are both human beings and one of them gets to impose their will on the other, you can't find that in any way moral. And secondly, it's destructive um, for economic value, even if you think about it in terms of, you know, the, the, the benefits overall. 
it's destructive towards economic value in the long run. So therefore, they become libertarian. They lean, according to today's political um, political spectrum, Austrian economists would be considered, you know, extreme libertarians mm -hmm. because they don't believe in any kind of government intervention in individual economic decisions, including intervention in the market for money. And so, for me, the most interesting aspect of Austrian economics, perhaps, and the one that I focus on in my book is the analysis of hard money and sound money uh, versus easy money or government-imposed money mm -hmm. and the detrimental effects that, ha that that has on an economy. And I think a lot of the problems that you see in the world economy today can be explained through the fact that we have long-term uh, money that loses its value in the long term, that incentivizes people to think in the short term, that incentivizes people to borrow more, to spend more, yes. rather than save and invest for the long run. I saw in the Mises report before the average life length of a fiat currency is 27 years. You yeah. take all the currencies around the world and you divide it, it's 27 years, the survival rate of that. And yeah. For me, it scares me. Like you look at the buying power of the American dollar right now, um, circa like say 1960 compared to that, you've lost tenfold in buying power. Yeah, uh, the, the inflation statistics don't necessarily reflect this pretty well because, you know, they change the kind of goods and because we need to understand that, um, you know, technology is always making things cheaper. So yeah, in, in a world of hard money, things will be getting makes cheaper. It cheaper mm -hmm. But if you follow Maslow hierarchy of needs, the stuff that us, we as humans need, food and shelter, Absolutely. are fucking going up. Exactly. <laughs> like exponentially going up. Yeah, inflation is not bad if you don't eat and don't live in a home and don't consume <laughs> energy. It's like, great, I got a cheaper fucking iPhone today. Exactly. But my rent is skyrocketed. Well, you know, when they calculate the inflation, they take into account the improvements in the processing power of your laptop. Yeah. So the, as, because your laptop is getting um, faster, they take that as a drop in the price of processing power. And so they average that with the increase in the price of the food. And so you come up with the magical 2 3% inflation that they always uh, mm -hmm. get at. But of course, that's just completely arbitrary about what you define as a good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, um, it conflates the technological improvement and the increases in productivity with the increases in the money supply and the monetary inflation, which is a long run phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's useful to compare um, uh, prices of food and essentials over mm -hmm. time. You see, I think, uh, a huge increase over time. And I think the produce has been increasing dramatically year by year. For sure, absolutely. All the things that are easy to produce in mass quantities, and mm -hmm. so that includes junk food. Yes. The price for junk food the drops, and so people are happy to say, you know, you look at, the, well, maybe French fries are getting cheaper, or, sure. um, you know, um, soda keeps getting cheaper. Sure. But that's just industrial stuff. And so, yeah, you get a bigger factory, you use more energy, and you um, have more um, <laughs> more industrial large-scale production involved. Yes, you can get the price down over time. It definitely happens. But that's not the nutritious stuff, the food that's actually nutritious that requires, you know, actual people to take care of it and grow it mm -hmm. over time and to maintain it. Well, that's still extremely expensive. Extremely right? It continues to become yeah. more and more expensive over time. Yes. And that, that explains, you know, the deterioration in people's health. I think this is a very important factor. Um, I didn't get into this in my book, but this is part of the new research that I've been working on since uh, finishing the book. Mm -hmm. The um, the you know the, the the prevalence of so much diseases, uh, so many diseases and obesity uh, is people think of it as just being a, a, a result of abundance because we eat a lot. But the reality is it's not really abundance. It's it's poverty really because people don't eat real healthy nourishing food because mm -hmm. instead they eat a lot of junk, and so it's it, it's poverty and it's it's, it's malnourishment. And uh, I think. It's, um, it's worth considering the relationship between the growth of this kind of food and the destruction of the value of the currency, mm -hmm. both in terms of uh, the, how much government has subsidized the unhealthy Weed, food, corn, soy, factory farming, soy. Exactly. All kinds of factory and intensive farming have been massively subsidized because they bring the prices of food down yeah. and so help downplay inflation. Whereas, and, and, that on, and that has you know, resulted in people w eating more and more of that stuff. Plus, you add to the fact that, you know, just the general aspect of um, what I call increasing time preference as a result of um, the decrease in the value of money. As people realize, you know, it's harder to save for the future, money is less likely to st uh, save it. 
um, to, to, to hold on to its value, people are less likely to think of the future and more likely to prioritize the present mm -hmm. more and more. And so this kind of decision making leads to more and more unhealthy decision making in all aspects of life. And so you see increases in debt as well as increases in um, diseases and obesity and so on. And I think it's, it's, it's really, um, it's really very, very telling to try and understand that through the lens of time preference. It's, it's my favorite topic in my book, chapter five, all about the relationship between money and time preference. And I think it's a very important topic that uh, people today should really be um, thinking about more. So let me ask you this question. It's, you know, let's, I think in the crypto world, I've been in the crypto space for a while now. And, uh, you know, we live in this bubble, right? You have, uh, you know, the, the Bitcoiner, maximalist or minimalist, and you have an open finance, decentralized finance with Ethereum crowd and all these different camps. And all of them, do you want to change the world? Great. But we live in this very tiny bubble. Uh, you and I here are talking about the benefits of Austrian economics, benefits of Bitcoin. But how can the majority of the world benefit from this information? What can my mom do? What can my brother do? What can that person on the street over there do that he maybe lived when he has $400 in savings? This is the majority. Like, that's the rest of it. What can they do with this information to benefit them or themselves, I should say? I mean, to be perfectly honest, I'm, I don't think of myself as an evangelist for Bitcoin. Sure. I don't particularly care um, if people get on Bitcoin or not. I'm fascinated by it as an economic phenomenon, but I want to make it clear to everyone, you know, I don't care if you buy Bitcoin and I'm not here to find use cases for mm -hmm. people. So, uh, you know, the person on the street may not have a use for Bitcoin. And I know a lot of people have no use for Bitcoin. They seem to be living their lives fine. So I'm, I'm not going to be uh, pushing it on people or uh, trying to um, impose it or try to find a way um, where it's useful. I think um, where it is interesting for people, um, you know, if somebody were to ask me what's interesting about it, I would say it's the, best, it's the most advanced form of money that has ever been invented. And so if you're curious about understanding why, I think you should first invest in reading about it, understanding what it does, how it works, um, why it works, how to own Bitcoin, how to transact with it, mm -hmm. and then understand um, the technical um, and technological capabilities it offers you. And I think this is a key point that, you know, with Bitcoin, ultimately the, 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 the uh, real value proposition for an individual is the fact that this is a way to send money anywhere around the world, send value anywhere around the world, without having to go through uh, many of the traditional intermediaries. And for most people, this isn't life changing, um, but it's a good, I think, uh, backup emergency plan to have. You know, you have a few hundred bucks yeah. uh, uh, stored in Bitcoin on a password somewhere. Might come in handy one day. You need to send money somewhere or well, we you- see it, uh, you know, bi well, you know, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general, they're being more or, le more or less used in places of need. Like we go back to Austrian yeah. economics, let the markets decide, you know, where the markets, uh, this natural equilibrium in Venezuela, right? We just had an interesting podcast the other day uh, talking about the volume in Venezuela. You look at Iran today, you look at Middle East, you know, my wife is uh, from Kuwait. We have a lot, a lot of relative, relatives over there. High volumes in Middle East, depending on where you are from, Russia, China. So places where it's a necessity, they're using it. So over here in North America, we're living in a bubble world, decent yeah. system, you know, decent government, yeah. you know, they're not coming out and knocking on my door, et cetera. So it's like, why the fuck do I need it really? But those places, I would say the majority of the world lives in some form of a dictatorship, some form of a government that has sanctions on what they can and can't do. Yes, and you know, these lines are fuzzy pretty much everywhere in the world. What yes. counts for being legal here is illegal oh, somewhere, somewhere else. else and yeah. Um, so, so the main value proposition for people is a, as a little bit of an insurance, you know, to just have a little bit of um, money there. I think for, for, for people in, in, in I think, um, people who think they have no problems in their own countries um, and with their banking system. But generally, I always say, you know, demand for Bitcoin is mm -hmm. an inverse um, function of trust in global central banks. Yes. And so as long as people uh, I, I think, you know, the, the, the worst thing that could happen to Bitcoin would be a return to sound money. I think, you know, the easiest way to kill Bitcoin, well, not necessarily the easiest, but I think the most effective um, way to kill Bitcoin would be for governments to implement complete free markets in money, um, probably a return to gold standard. Because then it loses its value prop. Exactly. If everybody can <laughs> use, yeah, absolutely. If, if everybody can use physical gold yeah. and, you know, we have global markets for the 
clearance of uh, physical uh, gold and digital gold backed by physical gold. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, perhaps the demand for Bitcoin would de decline uh, massively, but as long as um, people, uh, as long as governments impose capital controls, as long as inflation is a problem, mm -hmm. you can continue to see it uh, growing and in people finding more use in it. And I think the other thing is, um, it's a legitimate um, function of Bitcoin that people speculate on this user mm -hmm. case. And I think this is, people sometimes say, well, Bitcoin is only useful for speculation as if that's a bad thing. Yeah. But I think, you know, speculation is an, an, an essential function of markets. It's, it's what markets are all about. Yep. People are always speculating about um, different value propositions and they speculate by dedicating their money and their capital towards, um, towards things that they think will outperform in the future. And they're rewarded for making the correct choice. And so Bitcoin is a speculative bet in a sense that people who are holding it are betting that in the long run, it's likely going to prove to be a better system relatively to where it is today mm -hmm. in the future. It's going to improve compared to its competition. So um, the speculation and the speculative demand on Bitcoin is a legitimate demand. Um, and I think people will speculate on it. And the, the thing that drives Bitcoin forward for me, the, the most important is the fact that it's scarce. Mm -hmm. And so the scarcity of it means that as people speculate on it, nobody can increase more of the supply of it. And mm -hmm. so therefore inflate the quantity and um, increase the supply and bring the value down. And that's what, that, that's what makes it more attractive as a speculative bet for more and more people. Mm -hmm. what you, what's your predictions in the next year or so within the space in general? Um, I mean, generally, I, every year I make the same prediction, which is that Bitcoin is going to issue a new block every 10 minutes <laughs> according to the schedule. Yeah. And I've been, <laughs> I've been doing pretty well on this, so I'm going to stick uh, with this. Generally, I, I, I don't know. Um, th this is really what I think uh, matters the most in the space in general and in Bitcoin. Ultimately, um, it's a very simple technology that does one new block every 10 minutes or so. And if it continues to do that, uh, it continues to prove its reliability. And the longer it continues to survive doing that, the more interesting and compelling it becomes mm -hmm. as, a, as a monetary alternative. Cool. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you coming in. Speaking Thank with you. Us. Uh, if My people pleasure. want to get uh, in contact with you, I know you have a book. How can they reach you? Where, they, where can they get your book at? Yeah, so my book is The Bitcoin Standard. It's available at um, Amazon and has now been translated to 12 other languages. Oh, great, wow. So yeah, you can find out more about it on my uh, Twitter, Saifeddin, uh, S-A-I-F-E-D-E-A-N, mm -hmm. uh, on Twitter and also my website, saifeddin.com. And you can see my blog as well. Um, it contains more, some of my recent blog posts. And also you can uh, get my uh, subscription research on my Patreon on patreon.com slash Cool, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Cheers.